lightning like Steve McQueen. I'm in the fast lane when the light turns green. And I built tough, I ain't nothing but grit. Cause I made rugged blood, sweat, and spit. Yeah, like a horse I fly. Gonna push yourself in for a bumpy ride. I like to play hard, but I work harder. And I weather the storm cause I'm built stronger. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? We are back. We are live. It is the Freddy Coach Morning Show, the top morning show in transportation coming to you guys every single weekday, 8.30 in Pacific, 10.30 Central to break down some industry headlines, and most importantly, provide some actual insight into what you can do with all of this information. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. This is the real Sata Freight, ladies and gentlemen. And I say that before every single show. And what I mean by that is I will only speak to transportation professionals on this show because at the end of the day, you guys, I want to talk to the right individuals who have done what you're looking to do or who are currently doing what you're trying to achieve. So you can take all of this information, apply it, utilize it, and see a meaningful difference in your business and your life. Corey Buchan, happy hump day over on YouTube. Dylan Turner over on YouTube, as well as Tony Darnell, my man. Good morning to you, sir. He's also over on YouTube, you guys. I go live on YouTube because uh, from what I've been told by everybody who tunes in that it's exponentially better stream quality over on YouTube than over on LinkedIn. But enough about that. Enough on my soapbox, you guys. I got a very special guest for you guys here today. We're going to talk about accessorials. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff and kind of streamlining a lot of these things because accounting gets you in a ton of trouble with your carriers and your customers, and it just can be extremely time-consuming. So I have Marina Brown on the show, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about all of this. Marina, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, absolutely, Chris. I am super excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, you know, accessorials are such a pain in the ass sometimes, and, you know, keeping them all in track and everything. But, you know, before we get into any of that stuff, like, how did you get your start in freight, Marina? What brought you into this industry? Actually, my first uh, my first experience with transportation, uh, I got a job at Warner Enterprises. I'm sure you guys know the freight carrier uh, who also has a logistics division. And so I led uh, part of their um, development product and data science teams on the logistics side, working very closely with uh, carrier and sh uh, shipper reps, uh, very, very close into the whole logistics uh, experience and operations and got to see a lot of what we're doing right now firsthand. Yeah, no, I think that that is like that. So what, what happened? Like what experience did you have where you're like, all right, I got to go out and start this up and I got to, I got to get after this and do this on my own. Yeah. So after I worked with a, uh, after I worked with, uh, at Warner, um, I also ended up working with, uh, an awesome startup, um, that specializes in factoring here in, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And one of the things that was on, uh, that we frequently did was, uh, having to co-carriers around, uh, different accessorials and additional surcharges that we got on, um, uh, from, on the invoices from different carriers. Our goal was to pay within 24 hours, but oftentimes you just didn't know whether certain accessories were going to get approved or not and so we wanted to make sure that we were going to get paid for those and so my role wasn't necessarily to be helping people or to be in, as part of the operations and to pay it was different but because that needed to get done um i had to just pick up the phone and call a lot of logistics companies hey was this was this detention for real? Was this lift gate uh, happening? It really happened. And at the time, I remember thinking like there has to be a, a like an automated process in which you can actually communicate all of these charges and um, actually validate those with different uh, freight brokers or shippers. And there wasn't. So one day, um, myself and my co-founder were like. We should do that. Uh, spend some time actually validating whether or not this is a real problem. Turns out that there's hardly a supply chain company out there that will tell you that they do not get beat up by accessorials. Uh, one, with all of the additional charges they end up paying, but two, all of the human talent that actually goes into um, literally sitting on the phone, arguing with carriers, arguing with shippers, um, just dismissing yeah. business operations purely because of uh, of those surcharges. Have you found that carriers, and, and I'm not blaming carriers for this because I think, uh, to me, accessorials is something you shouldn't mess around with. Like, I, as a broker, um, it doesn't take much to send a revised rate confirmation with a lumper fee or any of that stuff immediately in it. 
more times than not. I would argue 99% of the time, you know if there's going to be an accessorial charge prior to the load even picking up because a lot of these facilities, Marino, that people are delivering into that have lumper fees, it's not a surprise that there's a lumper fee there. The amount might be different, but again, like it shouldn't take much to do this because customers, shippers always pay for that stuff. And any broker that's out there that's trying to make it a challenge, they're just trying to pad their own pockets. I'm going to call a spade a spade here. This is not as challenging as a lot of people make it out to be. I, you would think so, but I have found that not to be the experience. Um, oh, so first of yeah. all, like if you think about it, like when um, when you're booking freight, conversations happen so quickly, right? The yeah. um, um, the negotiations with the carrier, uh, what gets communicated, what is communicated from the shipper to you as a freight broker, right? Um, and that's one of the other things that actually we believe is a huge problem is the multi-channel communication that really doesn't happen between carriers, freight brokers and shippers. But like what gets communicated to you is ultimately what you're trying to get communicated to the carrier in a very fast paced um, environment. And sometimes all of that information does not come through um, or you just don't know. Like one of the things I would like to think we know is what you said, Chris, is that um, hey, like you deliver freight frequently to these facilities. You should know that there's a bumper. You might not know what it is, but there's no uh, there's no tools, right? A lot of that information is in the back of our minds, right? There's no tools today to say, hey, you're driving into that facility and it's 99% certain that you're going to have a lumper or that that facility frequently delays carriers two and a half hours or um, there's a lift gate associated with that freight. And because of that, we forget to put it on. And then the carrier gets there. Now they have a lumper that needs to get paid, but they need approval. And that approval now initiates a very manual process uh, that uh, we found through our research actually that for one accessorial to get approved uh, during transportation, it literally takes six people across four companies to touch it. That's insane to me. Like, yeah. I, 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 like to me, when it comes down to it, and and, and again, well, what you're doing is is very very beneficial because, you know, when when I'm out here moving freight, because you know the the joys of people listening to this podcast, is, you know, I, I don't talk in theory, you guys. This is shit that I actually do every single day. That like my day job is a freight brokerage. I own a freight brokerage. That's my day job. I've been doing this for a very long time, and more times than not when it comes to accessorials, when it comes to lumpers, it's a failure on the broker to notify the carrier that there's going to be a right. lumper uh, or yeah. the amount. Because it, it, it is as simple as this, Marina. Um, a customer just needs to see the lumper receipt and they're going to approve that amount. That It's right. as simple as that. The broker just needs to hey, $55 at Food Lion or $55 at Kroger. Hypothetical example, but we all know that Kroger charges lumpers. That you submit that to your customer, your customer approves it, you add it to the rate confirmation, you re resend the revised rate confirmation with the lumper on it, and you're done. And yeah. that, that is, that's right. as complex as it needs to be, but laziness starts to creep in, Marina. Laziness is what it boils down to. And my yeah. opinion, Chris Jolly's opinion is, is it is laziness by the broker to not add it to the rate confirmation, to send that revised number over, and then who knows? Maybe these guys are just hoping somebody forgets about that amount and then they just make extra money on the load. Well, and, and you have to think about it, right? They they don't make money. Hopefully they don't make money off of detention and, and lumpers, right? Um, you're making money from booking, booking loads. And when you have goals to meet on a daily basis um, and you have to book like 11, 12, 13, however many loads you're booking on that day, um, you're not thinking about the lumper, right? You're thinking like, how am I going to get that next load on my queue uh, taken care of? So, yeah. Um, and, and that's where systems comes in, come yeah. into, right? Technology. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we want uh, carrier reps and shipper reps to be focused on bringing that revenue, not necessarily to deal with like manual activities around. Um, booking or taking care of accessories and so why not leave that to technology to handle yeah no no i i agree with that and th this is another one of those steps in the in the process that should be automated right at the end of the day right. like it and same thing when it comes down to like detention and you know pre-approvals 
of, of char like a lot of this stuff. I, I just look at it like this from it, it, it from my perspective. If a carrier has a layover for for whatever reason, right. their relationship is with me, the broker. Their relationship yep. isn't with the shipper. So if there's any additional fees, they just need my approval. And then for right. like that added additional steps in there, I I just think that it's it's a giant waste of time from right. some people's standpoints. Where because I just look at it as if if there's a detention on a load. Um, I'm going to send over a revised rate confirmation right away. And then if my customer doesn't pay me for it, I need to question, do I want to work with that customer anymore right. at the end of the day, you know? So I, I think though that like, but then again, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, we'll, we'll go reefer freight, for example, there are lumpers, there's pallet yep. exchanges, there are ad additional accessorials that get add on, added on. Right. And it can get messy if you know maybe a driver forgot to submit the receipt or had lost the right. receipt or something like that then things can kind of start to go haywire right yeah and you know what like um i actually am working uh, uh or i was working last week with a shipper out of colorado actually and uh they move freight from overseas and think about like the pain that such accessorios uh, exert on shippers as well. Um, so they ended up with about 30% on top of what they had originally contracted in the marriage mm -hmm. and detention um, and other like poor taxes and, and, and such, but they, it wasn't their fault that the freight said there because of the lack of coordination between um you know, their freight forwarder and the carrier that was supposed to pick up the freight. But the freight sat there for close to two weeks and they ended up with a lot of charges. Now, well, obviously it re diminishes a lot of the profitability on their freight. And that's not a single example, right? This happens every day. Ultimately, we want to avoid that surprise, both mm -hmm. for shippers and for brokers. Um, let me Let me tell you that hey, you are likely going to experience additional charges and I am going to help you know what those are. And the better part is when they happen, I will be letting you know about it in real time, right? So not handing you a bill um, either like right before I deliver the load and demand that you pay all of these accessorials same day or I will hold your load hostage because we've seen that happen as well. Yeah. Um, but I will let you know as your freight sitting at the board that hey today your uh, your detention uh, or your demerge um, is going to be sixty dollars. Here's the total bill so far, right? So at least you're giving people a proactive financial update to where when the final bill actually arrives, they know they know what to expect yeah. and they can plan financially because at the end of the day that's their life life and blood and they want to make sure that they have um the opportunity to plan ahead no i i, I agree with that and i think like because that's a you know when you're mentioning talking to a shipper for example like you know if, if there's a co-packer out there and you know they're they're making for multiple brands and they're handling all of the transportation and everything for those multiple yeah. brands and each individual you know distribution center all has different accessorial charges and lumper fees and everything else that go on to it right. that the data behind that i think is is because like i i would want to know that is is hey fyi if you instead of sending out two 20 pallet loads um you know right. you should send out you know or, excuse me two 10 pallet partials or whatever that looks like it, it costs you less to ship one full truckload you you know and you can make better transportation decisions right. at that point to get it in there yep. and then again cleaner invoices because i think one thing um people like manufacturers and stuff they they judge you know different warehousing on overall fees what's coming in there are they loading them fast enough are they offloading them fast enough they want to know these things that's why the kpi aspect of things are so important to that decision because a lot of companies right. they don't want their brands to have a negative connotation out there in the market and if they're right. using a third-party co-packer or a third-party warehouse to manufacture yeah. label whatever that looks like they, they need to know that data so this is like yeah. where that that helps so much it paints yes. such a clear picture 
Yeah, yeah. That and you know, we started talking about the carriers at the beginning, but think about the impact uh, on on carriers as well. It's not just about that. Um, hey, you have a detention, but that detention may be stopping you from getting your next load, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, people carriers pay fines on those. It ruins customer relationships or or great broker relationships, and it's like in our day and age with the technology that we have um it's it's avoidable and either carriers ought to get paid for a mistake that was made uh, or they um or they need to be warned so that they can make proactive uh, proactive decisions like from conversations that we've had um about 70 percent of detention in the industry actually does not get paid out to carriers and if you That's not surprising at all actually yeah, and if you yeah. sat at the facility for six, seven hours and you miss your next load and you are a mom and pop carrier, then that costs you, um, you know, dinner at the table mm -hmm. for the next week. No, I, I, I agree. I agree with that, Marina. And, you know, again, I'm not going to sit here and advocate for anybody to do anything, but I will put it this way. If I was a truck driver, and I sat somewhere for six or seven hours, whether it's a shipper or a receiver, we'll call it Chris Jolly Trucking sits there. Right. Um, and the broker says that there was no detention paid on that load. Uh, Chris Jolly, the trucker, is going to call that facility and ask them about that. Hey, I was informed that there right. was no detention paid on this. I, I sat there for six hours. Uh, Tim Thomas fictitious name signed off on my bills uh that i was there from eight in the morning until uh seven o'clock at night what, what's going on yeah. i think some truckers might be you know at least chris jolly trucking would make a, a point to find out if there was actual accessorials paid on that yeah yeah absolutely one of the things that we're looking at doing at moniva is actually providing that three uh and sometimes four-way communication channel between carriers brokers shippers and mm -hmm. including factoring companies um in the mix because at the end of the day they oftentimes have to pay um the bill to the to the carrier but to me it's a matter of being proactive and being on time or real time right if i can um get the information from that carrier that they have detention pass it on to the broker and without like two or three different handoffs happening at that uh broker actually present that information to the shipper in real time as well sometimes you can alert the right personnel so that they can say so that you can say hey you're about to start you know this is going to start costing you you yeah. are now paying an hour two hours three hours of detention do something and prioritize the uh, unloading of that carrier that is information that today we don't get or it's information that's very manual right because the carrier has to call in into the broker someone has to pick up the phone or read the email from there you actually uh, have to communicate with the shipper rep the shipper rep has to sometimes get an approval from their manager and then you're calling the customer but then it's an hour an hour and a half later um simple to automate right those workflows um i mean i say simple there's a lot of actual decisions and the in intelligence that has to go into all of this but it's doable and by providing people that type of information you actually facilitate the later payment flow between the carrier the broker and and the shipper so how how do you see are, are you guys using because I, like I, obviously ai comes to top of my mind when when with with a lot of this stuff right because like I, i'm of the old school like i want to automate everything to a point right like i, I don't ever want to automate a carrier's experience with my company or a customer's experience with that com my company i want them to talk to me i want a human emailing them back yes i understand both sides of this i don't need to hear how ai is going to you know make everything better um, but I actually want to build a company with real human beings in it, not bots. But there are certain components of my job that technology and AI should be doing that. Because again, billing accuracy, I think, is probably one of the biggest hindrances of most organizations that they're not even aware of because they, they they just go back and forth via email and everything else where I feel like you could use AI. I mean, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, Marina, because I know you're very passionate about AI. Um how how can AI come in and help clean up people's billing, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, first of all, uh, by, the, by the way, I'm in the process of putting together 
a whole um, series of, uh, of articles that hopefully I'm ter I'll turn into videos as well around how AI is going to be applicable in mm -hmm. supply chain, anything from obviously billing and accessories, but we're talking um, routing optimization, network optimization, telematics, fleet, fleet management and all of that. So stay tuned for that one. But specifically to your question, um, one of the things that um, I absolutely agree, right? A, a lot of brokerages think that technology is their differentiator, right? And I don't think that that's necessarily a true statement. You often hear people on brokerages say like, hey, our business is very different from everyone else, so we're going to build our own TMS or we're going to build our own insert here, the technology. Um, and I think, you know, recent events over the last year or so have shown us that you can have the best technology and still not perform well, right? It's say that the again. people. Can you say that I again? Said, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, but it's the truth, right? It's the people it that at the end of the day build the relationships and these relationships build your business. So we don't want to remove that relationship building from from your your business um but what we want to be able to do is there's mundane and ex mundane experiences that um you don't necessarily it's not a relationship building opportunity it's a trust building opportunity and when i say trust it means the carrier needs help and you're there to help them right and if that help means that you have, for example, a voice assistant that picks up the phone for you and it helps that carrier with whatever issue they have without necessarily involving your human counterpart um, and helps that carrier in the moment and the carrier leaves with, hey, either I now have an approval on that lumper uh, or I know what my next steps are in order to get uh, unloaded or whatever then that is the trust that you need between the carrier and the broker because at the end of the day job gets done and communication is there um so yes absolutely like ai is not there to replace humans you still need those relationships but for example understanding some of the rules and applying those rules that exist between a shipper and a broker so that when you approve a carrier um lumper uh, at a facility uh or other uh, permits or whatever, right? You're moving alcohol or, or specific foods. And you know what the agreement is between the shipper and a broker. And you don't need two or three people to actually say, yeah, I rubber stamp this, right? And that your AI counterpart, co-pilot, actually understands the rules, knows what has been decided in the past and can now take all of that information and make the decisions and present it either to the carrier or to the shipper automatically. Mm -hmm. That I, I feel like that's beautiful and that's simple, right? It does not, it's, it's not necessarily the relationship building part of the experience. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that, Marina. And I think like one thing that is, is often overlooked is, is, you know, when, when, when you're building a business, you, you understand this because you're a co-founder. Um, I've boots. I've been bootstrapping for the past four years. Um, it's not as easy as making a social media post about how how you're just crushing it out there, you guys. Like, yeah, I, I think people tend to forget that you know it, it costs a lot of money to do things, and when yeah. you're really trying to formulate your company, you might not have the capital to spend a by and, and to, to hire a six figure salary. You might not have yep. that capital. You need to find workarounds to get to that level to build right. your business up. And that's where I think technology can help right. expedite some people's journeys because human, yeah. you know, like the human aspect of, of business, it's it's very challenging. It's very challenging to do that because you know what? You got human emotions that come into it. And you know, the reality is is it's dollar in, dollar out. You know, you right. you, you guys when when you're actually building a business, all right, if you make ten thousand dollars in revenue. You know, that that's all you have to spend unless you want to get into copious right. amounts of debt via credit card, because yep. lines of credit don't just miraculously get thrown at you when you're building a company up. And, you know, you're going to have yep. a lot of personal guarantees associated with your business. So how do you elevate right. your game? How do you yep. without driving yourself nuts? 
because yeah. that's another component of this as well that comes in because you could sit there and stare at a spreadsheet all day long with assessorial right. fees and charts about yeah. what company is getting paid this, what customer got approved on that. You could do that all day long. And guess what? You look up, you didn't make any sales that day. You didn't move right. any front that day. Yep. You didn't make any money that day. Yeah. Like back to the point of actually uh, humans, right? Like there are revenue generation activities that we all do in our da daily jobs. And then there's those that are not. And to me, like you look at all of your processes that you do today. I tell people often, like anytime when you touch a paper or um, you're manually entering information into a spreadsheet, that's where you need technology, right? For sure. That's a like that's basic. Yeah. You have to build up from there. But like how how you're differentiating yourself is by implementing technology where you have non-revenue generation activities. You're saving like at the end of the day, I tell people our uh, AI agent, we call it funny enough, surcharge. Surcharge doesn't sleep, right? And surcharge doesn't leave you. Like you said, people um uh, people leave right yes like you don't have to spend twenty thousand dollars afterwards looking for your new employee because surcharge is always there and with all of the training and data it actually gets better over time right yeah. uh, overnight hours it's you're not going to um you don't need to wake up people in the middle of the night because surcharge is there it will make decisions for you and in the morning it will provide you information on all of the decisions it's made all the conversations had um i i think like every time like, i i feel the next in the age of ai that we're in um the businesses that will ultimately succeed are going to be the ones that optimize all of their um non-revenue generation workflows and implement that technology and it's not realistic for you to think that I'm going to build that technology myself because technology these days moves so fast. Yeah. I always tell, uh, I always say broker, tell brokers, like leave the technology to technology companies who live and breathe that. And you focus yeah. on what you do best, which is moving freight. Right? Um, it, so yeah. I was gonna say, I think it boils down to the build versus buy model that's out there. And sometimes it is cheaper to buy something that's already established and already had all the kinks work out. And, you know, I yeah. look at it because, you know, I, I tour warehouses, I go out and visit places. And, you know, recently I saw a couple of warehouses that now have a robot that like actually for like, cause the boxes are shipped in, not you know, obviously put together. So they have a robot that yeah. actually starts the packaging process right there. And it picks, it's like for an order picking process. So it's like who out there. And, and again, I want you to take, take stock for the anti-technology people out there who out there is going to apply for a job where your job is, is to right. put boxes together and tape them. You're not going to do yeah. that. Right? right. So I think like yeah. that's where you can leverage technology for the future in those non-revenue producing yes. roles that you're talking about there. It's not that you're yeah. looking to replace a human being now you can get that person out of that mundane role and put them in a job yeah. that actually moves the needle for them i think yeah. ai's big or like an ai company's biggest issues marina is they have a sh they're terrible at marketing i like i think <laughs> the way that they're marketing it, it is bad it's not what it does that's bad it's how they're marketing it and that's why i'm telling them all every ai company out there talk to your boy i'll make you guys not sound like such uncompassionate un un assholes i love it <laughs> But I, lo I love your point, right? Like, did, uh, think about the carrier sales rep that you're hiring. Like, uh, is like, are you presenting the job to them as, hey, 20% of your time, you're gonna sit there and uh, talk to carriers on any of the extra charges or you know conflicts that come up during transportation? Do you think they're going to like, that's the fancy part of their job? Yeah, nobody's, no. told. Yeah, nobody, <laughs> nobody's told that at all. But uh, Marina, how does anybody reach out to you to find out more? We're already at the top of the hour here. These shows always fly by. How does anybody reach out to you to find out more about what you got going on? Absolutely. I, uh, look me up on uh, LinkedIn. Marina D. Brown is my uh, LinkedIn tag. Uh, or you can also get us on uh, our Moniva website. It's M O N E. IVA, ask me next time when we talk how we came up with that name, uh, Muniva dot, uh, dot com. Uh, but yeah, other, those are probably the best ways to, to get on me. 
Perfect. Marina, thank you so much for joining me. And if you guys can't find Marina for some reason, just hit me up. I will gladly put you guys in contact with her. Um, as always, you guys, if you guys got value in what you heard today, subscribe to the show, you guys. Share it out there to your network because if you see value, your network's going to see value as well. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And we'll be talking to you soon.